freaking genius. Somehow you gotta get him a ship. You need a scene with a ship. Something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids was turned into the opening scene of the movie, which is really cool. And we're gonna talk about maybe why they did that at the end. Hi there, I'm Nicole Wilbert. I'm a writer and story nerd and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am so excited for today's video. I am going to be analyzing famous scenes. So a week ago I put out a video all about mistakes that I make when I'm writing my scenes and in that video I actually derived a scene card that I use to plan the scenes out before I write them. So derive like when you were in math class as a kid and your teacher kind of walks you through all the steps. So I did that for people who would be interested in that and that's if you're interested in that, that sounds good. I talk about the three sort of ingredients. There's lots of resources linked. Go check that out. But I also know that when I was in math class, I never paid any attention to the derivation and I wanted the examples. So today we have all the examples. I am going to be analyzing famous scenes and talking about the structure, why they work, and really digging deep into them so we can learn from them and become better writers. All right, let's go. All right, so the first scene is from To Kill a Mockingbird. This is the scene description is an angry mob comes to lynch Tom Robinson. They're facing off against Atticus outside the courthouse when Scout, Dill, and Jem run up. Um, in terms of our inciting incident, Scout's desire to see her father and make sure he's safe is the want that drives our inciting incident, that creates our inciting incident, which is when the children run across the street and join the mob scene. How do other characters create escalating conflict? So Atticus tells Jem to go home, but Jem refuses. He says, no, sir. One of the mob tries to grab Jem and Scout kicks him in the shin. <laughs> and then one of the mob tells Atticus to get the children out there. Atticus tells Jem again, go home, and Jem continues to refuse, continues to say no. So we see we have escalations here. We start with Atticus saying it, then the mob gets physical, then Atticus is like, yo. Yeah. Uh, the turning point, see if you can guess it, it's really obvious and wonderful in this scene, is when Scout spots Mr. Cunningham, thanks him for the walnuts, and talks about his son Walter, and how entailments are bad, but he shouldn't worry. And that's a huge turning point in this scene because you can see everybody's faces change. How does a decision um, lead to the climax of the scene? So here, Mr. Cunningham has what we call the crisis. He's the one who has to make the decision. Scout keeps talking while everyone stares at her. She's confused about what's happening. Uh, Mr. Cunningham and the whole mob pretty much have to decide how they're going to respond to Scout's words now. They're looking around at each other and Scout starts saying, what? What did I say? I'm so sorry, I didn't mean any harm. And then in the climax of the scene, Mr. Cunningham says, I'll tell Walter you say hi. He calls on the other men to clear out. And that's our climax. So how does the scene resolve? The scene resolves with the men leaving. Atticus tells Tom Robinson he's safe. And as they're walking home, Atticus reaches out and ruffles Jem's hair, his one gesture of affection. So, <laughs> um, how does this scene turn? So I said this scene turned on an incredible value. Some scenes are just, you know, like not knowing to knowing. This one I said was barbarity to humanity. What's really cool about this is you can see so easily in this scene how the turning point of the scene is actually the point where you have this value shift because you have this mob. They like, we're gonna grab children even, and it goes to humanity at the end. And the fact that it was a six year old, oh God. <laughs> so why is this scene in the novel? Number one, I just wrote theme. I really wanted to write how could it not be? I mean, it's such a pivotal scene, but it's so thematic. Just the innocence of the children pitted against the awful, horrible racism and craziness of the mob. And there's also some character development in there for Jem and for the Cunninghams. You see a bit of a shift for Jem as well from kind of like unrespected to respected. That's not the overall shift, but that is also happening for Jem in the scene and Scout's just kind of confused the whole time, which is a great example of how it doesn't have to always be like a shift for the protagonist. Um, in the story or the viewpoint character. They don't always have to sort of lead the charge and how the scenes are shifting and changing. 
So what makes this scene so great? It is literally a masterpiece of a scene. And when Mr. Cunningham is forced to see himself through Scout's eyes, he becomes ashamed of the contrast between the good man that she sees because she thinks he's good. She's She sees him there to kill a man and she's like, hey, like, we're gonna help you with your entailment. She's, he's ashamed of the contrast between the good man that she sees and the evil man he has become by joining the mob. Away, it's freaking genius. Hey, I'm just popping in here to say that if you're still watching this video, give it a big thumbs up. It really helps me. I really appreciate it. And if you're not subscribed, do that because we've been moving between like 397 and 399 for like five days now and it's kind of driving me crazy. So if we could just get to like 402, I would be so happy. Woohoo. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the video. So example number two is from the Chronicles of Narnia, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. We're going to talk about the opening scene. Um, so scene number one, when the Pevensies are awakened by an air raid. So I thought it would be really interesting to point out that this scene actually is not in the novel. It was made create specifically for the movie. The opening of the novel is once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. This story is a, something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. And that sentence, something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids, was turned into the opening scene of the movie, which is really cool. And we're going to talk about maybe why they did that at the end. But let's get into our sort of five commandments tweaked five commandments to make them easier to notice. So what characters want drives the inciting incident of this scene? I would say it's a force more than anything, and we actually do see them first. The first shot of the movie is on the guys in the planes. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> they definitely don't drive planes like this. Okay, uh, it's more a force than anything. The Germans want to bomb London into submission and they begin a, a nighttime air raid. We see the Germans first in the planes above the searchlight, so that's our inciting incident. So how do other characters' forces create escalating conflict? Edmund is staring out the window. His mother comes in. She yells at him, what do you think you're doing? She tells him to get to the shelter really quickly. Uh, Lucy's hiding in her bed, and she needs to be rescued by Susan. So that's kind of, I wouldn't even say those are progressive complications so much as we care about the people who are about to get bombed now. Um, basically, what creates the conflict is like the family wants to get to safety. The final escalation of the conflict, the turning point, is when Edmund yells, we forgot dad, and he turns around and he runs back into the house. The decision that leads to the climax of the scene is, um, I think it actually happens in a split second. So in the To Kill a Mockingbird scene, the decision was very much, you know, they were, they were thinking about it for a long moment. Here it's split second. Peter decides to run after Edmund. The climax of the scene is when a bomb explodes, like right next to the house. It breaks the window. The two boys kind of fall to the ground. Um, Edmund grabs his dad's picture as Peter drags him out of the room. There's this epic overhead shot from the plant's perspective of the boys running through the yard. So that explosion of the glass and them being on the ground and everything is our climax. How does the scene resolve? The boys get to the shelter. Peter shouts at Edmund for being selfish and their mother hugs Edmund. So <laughs> how does the scene turn? It starts with impending danger, escalating danger to safety, or you could say it's like possibility of death to life. It's an action story, and one of the things that the story grid does is they identify that different genres have different sort of life values associated with them. So in action stories, you're usually shifting in those major scenes on life and death. So because the Chronicles of Narnia is in movie form, an action story, they kind of had to set it up to show us that it is actually going to be an action story, which is why I think they put this scene as the opening scene, an action scene. It's kind of a prototypical, don't worry, you're going to get action a little bit later thing, you know? So I already talked a little bit about why the scene is in the movie, but more than just being an action scene and setting that up, um, it really establishes character, right? The book is very story-like and beautiful. But books are always adapted for the screen and creating a movie for a modern audience kind of involves like making the character development a little less complex and a bit a bit faster because you don't have as much time so it has the arcs have to be sharper and to the point so this wasn't included just to hook people on action but to establish who the characters are 
and their backstories. So we develop empathy for them real quick. We develop empathy for the mother and we see Edmund break the rules. <laughs> we see how Peter goes to save him. Peter is sort of the leader of the group and really taking charge. It establishes the setting and the reason for why the children will go to the country without their parents. And it also sets up a kind of cool parallel. Their dad's fighting the war while the children are fighting in Narnia. So what makes this scene great? It's not action for the sake of action. It's high emotion, it's high intensity. The reason it's high emotion and high intensity is because it's so character driven. Every time I watch it, I feel that emotion, I feel the panic because I'm so immediately concerned for the characters and it's, it's a great opening scene. I just, I love watching it just because I find it so gripping. All right, and our third example, this was an, almost not a book, I'm sorry. It's from Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, when Jack and Will steal the Interceptor, which is a ship, by the way. <laughs> so uh, our first question, what characters want drives the inciting incident of the scene? Captain Jack Sparrow wants a ship, and the inciting incident, I think, is... You could say it's when they get onto the boat, um, but I personally think it's when they get under the canoe boat type thing. How do other characters' forces create escalating conflict, progressive complications? So Will steps in an anchor for a barrel and he ends up dragging this barrel along past all of the people on the docks. And it's not really a progressive complication, but it's very funny, so I thought I would mention it. Uh, they get on the boat, they tell the crew that they're taking the ship. Progressive complication. Everyone laughs, and the captain says the ship can't be crewed by two men. This is a progressive complication for the audience, because we're like, oh no, what are they going to do? Uh, progressive complication escalating conflict. Jack Sparrow holds a gun to his head. Uh-oh. Then it just cuts right to the evicted crewmen who are on that ship, who are now on this little dinghy boat. They go like, ah, and they get the attention of the crew on the interceptor. Um, the Commodore says, that is without a doubt the worst pirate I've ever seen. And then uh, our final progressive complication is Will and Jack see the Interceptor coming towards them. So what is our turning point? So what's really cool about this scene is that all the crew of the Interceptor goes on to this ship to find Jack and Will. Meanwhile, Jack and Will swing on to the Interceptor and they sail right away. That's our turning point because we're like, oh, Oh my gosh, they are geniuses, whoa! What decision leads to the climax of the scene? This is a decision by the Commodore. He decides, he has to decide what to do. He decides to fire on his own ship. So his decision was kind of, do I let them get away? Do I fire on my own ship? He decides to fire on his own ship in order to get it out of the hands of the pirate. But Jack and Will actually disabled the rudder chain so they can't get anywhere. And the evicted sailors have to abandon their ship because the boat they were on gets crushed to smithereens. <laughs> so how does the scene resolve? The Commodore's assistant says, that's got to be the best pirate I've ever seen. And Jack and Will sail away in their ship. How does this scene turn? It's actually very obvious um, in what the Commodore is saying, right? Cause like two, one minute ago, they were like, that is the worst pirate I have ever seen. And now they are saying that's the best pirate I've ever seen. So the shift, very obvious, both for the Commodore and for the audience, because remember, this is the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie, and so far, all Jack has done is get himself arrested, <laughs> pretty much. So the scene turns from fool, Jack Sparrow's a total fool, to genius. Why is this scene in the novel? Practically, Jack needs a ship so he can chase Barbosa and get Elizabeth. So somehow you gotta get him a ship. You need a scene with a ship. This is where we can really learn the lesson of magical cookies, because he could have just gone to a guy and been like, can I get you some money or, you know, but they really used this thing, this thing that they needed Jack to do to get the ship to show his character to establish that sort of everyone thinks he's a fool but he's really this like odd genius sort of situation and it was a real magical cookie of just the <laughs> the craziness of him getting the ship like everything from the canoe to faking out the interceptor amazing uh, number two is it's still really early in the movie. We need to gain confidence in Jack as an actual competent pirate. So we have a lot of character dev here, but it's not necessarily the kind we're used to. And I'm going to get into that in why is this scene great. So Jack is a character who does not change. He does not have a character arc. He is like James Bond. We like him the way he is. We don't want him to change. 
Remember, this is the first movie. So with these kind of characters, why we should love them for exactly who they are needs to be established, and we kind of need to be told that they won't have an arc. So I think by the end of this scene in the movie, the audience is like very sure that this is a character who is not gonna have an arc, and he's gonna be this way forever and ever. Because this is a prototypical Jack Sparrow moment where his craziness just, his craziness just works. <laughs> it's amazing. And the dialogue of the Commandant, he might be the best pirate I've ever seen, establishes that he's a character who's not going to change. And it's freaking chock full of magical cookies, and it's a, it's a great scene. <laughs> so what are some of your favorite scenes from movies and or books? Have you kind of sat down and tried to analyze scenes in this kind of detail? Do you find this interesting, helpful? This was really fun for me to do. So if it was really fun for you, let me know because I can see a whole bunch of these videos outcoming. I have a million different themes. I could probably change my channel to just analyzing scenes. I'm not going to do that, but I definitely I'm thinking of doing some more if you like it. So if you do like it, give it a big thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please let me know your thoughts and I will see you next time.